This week in IT, Microsoft is bending its own rules with an exclusive Windows 11 update for new AI PCs only. Teams is about to stop auto-blocking malware and phishing attempts for everyone by default. And if you're migrating from Slack to Teams, Microsoft is rolling out a new tool to help make the process as seamless as possible. So stay tuned for all the latest news. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Microsoft 365, Windows, and Azure. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Chaosoft. Well, it's a new year and it's time for CES again. It happens always in January, of course. I think it's kind of lost its significance a lot and the press aren't covering it in the way that they used to. At least that's kind of been the trend since the COVID pandemic. But there was a little bit of interesting news for Windows administrators and enthusiasts this week. And Call Karma announced their new X2 Plus processor. Now, if you remember two years ago, Microsoft and Qualcomm released these new processors and new Surface laptops. And of course, third parties could also put these ARM processors into their notebooks as well. They were essentially pitched as a challenger to Apple's M series of chips. And while they perform significantly better than any previous ARM chip for Windows devices that we'd ever seen before, there were still some definite shortcomings, especially in the area of graphics. Now, Qualcomm promised that they were going to improve, especially the graphics performance in the next generation of chips. Now, if you remember back to last year, I think it was around September, they announced their Snapdragon X2 Elite, which is going to be in some of the more premium notebooks launching by the end of the first quarter, essentially in 2026. Now, at CES, they announced the X2 Plus. Now, I was actually looking through some of the chips that are already available on the market. And to be honest, I didn't realize there were so many of them. So you have the Snapdragon X, the X Plus, and the X Elite. And the only chip that they'd spoken until up until now was the X2 Elite. So anything that's with X2 is this new series of Snapdragon chips. There have been, of course, some benchmarking um, results put out there by Qualcomm themselves. I'm not sure that anybody's independently got their hands on these chips to verify those results, but there are significant improvements. So let's talk a little bit about these X2 chips and what it means for Windows on ARM. So these new X2 chips in general are supposed to be bringing a 35% faster processor, a 39% faster GPU, and an MPU, so that's the neural processing unit that handles all the, well, essentially, where all the AI tasks are offloaded from the CPU, it's a dedicated processor just for localized AI tasks, will perform up to 80 tops. So that's a 78% jump compared to the pre previous uh, generation. So what Microsoft is doing is releasing a, a new base of the OS of Windows 11 called Bromine, which is essentially being optimized for these devices. So you know, maybe there are going to be new power management requirements new technical requirements to support this X2 series of chips. And Microsoft is saying this is essentially Windows 11 26H1. Now, they did something a little bit similar to this. I think it was with 24H1. One. We can't really call it H1 because there wasn't an H1 and an H2. So as these new Surface notebooks were being released, they essentially pre-released the 24H2, which everybody else was going to get later in 2024. They didn't give it a separate H1 tag like they're doing in 2026. It didn't include a lot of the new features, but it was there to support the new Snapdragon X processors for Windows. And they're doing something similar this year. They're just given it a name. Now, everybody else will not be seeing this 26H1 version of Windows 11, even people who already have one of these Snapdragon ARM processors you're going to have to wait for 26H2. Now, 26H1, you know, much like Microsoft did before, isn't going to include any new features. It's just that base Bromine platform that is required to support the new X2 processors. And new features will come at the same time for everybody when uh, 26H2 is released this fall. So a lot of the press have kind of spun this as Microsoft breaking their one release per year rule. Well, they kind of 
have done this before. They're just given this particular version of Windows a separate name, so 26H1. So it's not actually something dramatically different from when these first generation of Snapdragon uh, X uh, processors were released for the Surface devices and other third-party devices as well. So what is it with Windows and ARM? What's been happening? Well, Windows and ARM, you know, hasn't done badly and hasn't done that well either. I think the biggest problem with Windows and ARM, of course, is compatibility. They're not great at running games. There are still pieces of software that everybody wants to use that are running in emulation mode. And while this emulation mode is, you know, significantly better than anything that had come before it, of course, there is still a performance hit. A lot of games don't run, so these aren't machines for gaming. So people look at these devices and think, well, I might want to add, I don't know, a printer, a game at some point in the future, some kind of hardware. And there are just lots of compatibility issues. Now, I think as Qualcomm and Microsoft work to improve the performance and the compatibility. Well, let's speak about the performance. As they grow to increase the performance, if these can seriously give the Apple M series chips a run for their money, then I think more and more people will start to buy these devices and maybe accept some of the compatibility limitations. Now, the problem is it's a bit of a vicious circle because more people need to start buying these devices before you know, software vendors and hardware manufacturers will actually start to update their software and hardware drivers to work with the Windows on ARM platform. So hopefully when these new devices are released at the end of the first quarter, we'll start to see more uptake. And of course, there are other advantages like battery life and this kind of thing that make these ARM-based devices quite attractive, although the Intel Copilot Plus PCs I've not used personally, but apparently even in terms of battery battery life, give these ARM devices quite a run for their money. And of course, you've got all the compatibility with the Intel platform that you don't have with ARM. So it'll be very interesting to see how all of this plays out. Before I go on to the next story, I've got a quick favour to ask you. About 67% of the people who watched the last video were not subscribed to the channel. Now, as we're today on about 13,870 subscribers, I'd love it if we could push that up to 13,900. So if you'd like to see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Microsoft has said that they're going to be rolling out a new tool that's going to make it easier to migrate from Slack to Teams. Now, this is in preview at the moment and basically what it does is it takes an exported zip of particular channels that you have in Slack and it inserts all of that information into a team that you a team channel that you choose so you can map a particular channel in slack to a particular channel in teams so you need to do that bit manually but all of those messages files uh, and what have you will come across to that channel now there are some limitations to this at the moment it only supports channels so you won't be able to migrate your direct messages from slack to teams integrations and apps that you have in Slack are not automatically migrated to Teams either. So if they exist in Teams, you're going to have to set those things up again manually. The channel members get migrated across to Teams. So you don't have to repopulate the channel with users. Microsoft has also said that they're using Slack standard API to pull the data out. So you should that should make this a more reliable process that you can be confident in is actually going to complete and work. Microsoft says this is also something that you should inform users about before you do it because the Slack message history will also appear in Teams. So that's something you need to bear in mind. And to review any compliance settings in Teams to make sure the data is appropriately protected and that you're not going to end up with something being compromised or revealed that should not have been. But hopefully this tool should make it a lot easier for organizations to move from Slack across to Teams if that's what they decide to do. Now Microsoft says you can monitor the status of your migration 
action jobs. You'll be able to see what's happening. It's being released in preview now up until the end of January. And then Microsoft says that they hope it will be available for wider use, for general availability, if you like, in March. Microsoft has announced some secure by default settings that are going to be coming to teams, organizations that are using the default settings, the default security settings for teams. So if you haven't already applied your own custom set of configurations for security. Now, essentially, these new default settings were being trialed. They're going to be enabled for everyone, I think, by the end of this month. And essentially, they're going to start blocking malware attempts or any files that are considered to be more risky. So you won't be able to do things like send a you know, an executable file through Teams, and they're going to use scanning of URLs to make sure these files are detected and any kind of phishing attempts. And all this is being done with artificial intelligence. So if the scanner discovers, let's say, a URL that it believes to be malware or some kind of phishing attempt, instead of seeing the URL, you'll see a red warning banner where that URL would have appeared in the message. This has been a big problem with Teams because attackers are using it more and more for social engineering, trying to get inside organizations and get sensitive information out of people, whether that be usernames, passwords, or whether it's infecting devices with malware. Teams is now quite a big route for that to happen. Microsoft is also providing a false positive report so that users can see if things are being blocked when they probably shouldn't be, and users will be able to say, no, that's a little bit too much. I was expecting that, and they will be able to unblock block, as I understand, attachments and things, or maybe even URLs. I'm not quite sure exactly how that's going to work, or whether that's something that also organizations will be able to turn off if they want the user to go through some kind of process to unblock things that seem to be malicious, but may not be, of course. Microsoft is telling admins that if you want to make sure you have a variation of these default settings, you need to do it by January the 11th, because come Monday, they're going to start applying these new defaults to organizations that are using the default security settings. So remember, if you have a custom policy already in place, this isn't going to affect you. But if you think any of these new defaults might be some kind of problem, then you need to create your own custom policy now and do it quickly. But in general, this is a good move. Of course, lots of organizations are just using the default policy. They don't go to customize their security settings. And this is going to make teams safer for those organizations. If you found the information in today's video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave the video a like. I'm going to leave you with another video on the screen now about updates to Copilot Studio. So do check that out if you're using that in your organization. I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's video again, Chaosoft. But that's it from me today, and I'll see you next time.